A few more people just grabbing a seat. Chattering falls to a dull roar. Okay, welcome everybody to the PG Conf for you 2024 Lightning Talks. Who has been to a Lightning Talk session before? And who hasn't? There's a few of you. Um, okay, I'll uh, try not to get wet and electrocute myself. Um, so we did things a little bit differently this year. Those that have been to pre previous PG comps will know that what we normally do is put a flip chart up by the reg desk. You come, you write your name and your talk title down, and then we just pick the first 12 or so. Karen here, one of our wonderful organizers, <laughs> wanted to mix things up a little bit this year and use a new system which didn't rely on the fact that you were the fastest person to get to the board to get your talk on the agenda, and also to give some new speakers a better chance of being able to speak. Uh, because a lightning talk's a really good way to do your first talk or your first couple of talks when you're not quite so confident and you just want to have a go, see if you like it, and so on. So we had two different colors of cards. People wrote down their, their name, their email address, and the title of their talk, either on one of these blue cards or one of the yellow ones. I think the yellows were for new speakers, right? Put them in the box, and then Karen picked out a dozen at random which by some miracle happened to end up being six blue and six yellow. Um, so, no, well, neither do I really, but it's the way it worked out. So we have 12 speakers, which hopefully are all, you're all sitting in the front row, if you're one of our speakers. Yep, 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 yep. You're on the second row ads. Okay. Ah, okay. And for some reason, my laptop's decided to ignore the fact I turned off the screensaver and keeps going to sleep. Hopefully, it won't do that when we're doing talks. So, this is our list of talks. If you're one of our speakers, please take a quick note of your number. And we're, uh, this is going to be really hard for me to read to introduce people. So, if, first of all, we've got PostgreSQL contribution team. That's got to be Christoph, right? Okay. Yeah. Hello. So, some news or what's the contributors team about? So, yeah, what we're doing is um, we are managing this web page, PostgreSQL.org Community Contributors, which you've probably all seen. I haven't done a screenshot because it's just a very, very long list with lots of names. Um, there's seven core team members listed at the moment. That's the part we are not managing, but they are still listed on that page. Um, we have 50 majors contributors listed at the moment and 33 contributors. And there's also lists for uh, past contributors where people get moved over once they stop contributing to the community, but we still want to acknowledge that they're there. So the whole thing is managed by the Postgres contributors team, um, consisting of Melanie Plagemann, who, who agreed to join earlier this year, so thank you for that. Joe Conway and myself. So, and what we're doing is to looking for more contributors to actually recognize on that list. Um, stuff that we are recognizing is uh, code contributions to Postgres itself, to the, um, to the extension, other software in the Postgres ecosystem, translations, people running the project infrastructure like sysadmins, people running conferences, people giving community support uh, on IRC, on Stack Overflow, and so on and so on, people doing community organization, running the um, Postgres organizations, people doing publicity, and all the rest. And actually, all the rest is the hard 
part because we are not always we, we don't always know where to look at, and yeah, perhaps the list is order, also ordered by the difficulty of um, looking at, at it. So yeah, what we want to is to get new people on the list. Um, to get in there, contributors should be continually have been contributing for something like two years, and for major contributors, it's something like continued substantial contribution over three years. It's uh, intentionally somewhat wack because it, it's hard to define that for all of the categories. So if you want to and know someone who should be on the list, nominate them. You can also nominate yourself just by emailing the list there. And um, perhaps if you are al uh, already on the list, can you think of anyone who is doing th similar things than you and who's still missing? And then in that case, please email us. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you, Christoph. There we go. That's better. Um, one of the things that I didn't tell you while I was busy not being electrocuted was, as these are lightning talks, they only get five minutes to, to give them. So I've got a timer here. If that buzzes, then you're done as a speaker. You're off the stage, and it's on to the next one. So speaking of next one, die. Um, yeah. Does this work? Okay, cool. This works. Um, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Dee. Uh, I work on a startup called Lantern, and uh, recently we were looking into how to build a simple version of BM25 as a Postgres extension. Um, we wanted to see how far we could get with as little code as possible. And today I wanted to share a bit about what that process looked like. Um, so to start, uh, what is BM25? Um, so BM25 is a scoring function for text search. Uh, it's used in dedicated search engines like Elasticsearch. It considers term frequency within a document and term frequency across all documents. Um, so this means that when uncommon words uh, match your query, then those results are given more weight and more likely to show up at the top. Um, so what goes into BM25? I have a screenshot of the algorithm here, but it's actually very simple. Uh, to implement BM25, you just need to keep track of four pieces of information. Um, so one is the total number of documents, two is the document frequency per term, Three is the term frequency in documents, and four is the average document length. So our first approach used only SQL, so no C, no Rust, nothing like that. Uh, it involved creating auxiliary tables that stored the document ID, term, term frequency, and document length. Um, so we can calculate uh, all the statist statistics using uh, aggregates like sums and joins. Uh, so basically, uh, every single row has a term and a document. But as you can imagine, this is very slow. Uh, for common terms that appear in many documents, it required a lot of index lookups, uh, one for every document that used the term. So this led to, led to poor performance on larger data sets. So our second attempt uh, used only PL Rust, which is a trusted language that's enabled for Postgres and cloud providers like uh, AWS. So this improved performance by using a different auxiliary table, one that pre-aggregated the information in arrays instead of row by row. So this reduces index lookups to just one term per query. Sorry, um, one lookup per uh, term in the query. So it's sort of an allusion to uh, columnar storage, um, not fully, of course, but uh, inspired by. And then our last attempt uh, basically built off of the previous attempt and used PGRX to write a custom aggregate function. So the custom aggregate function would handle calculating all the uh, four statistics that I mentioned earlier uh, at the same time. Instead of if you use sum and aggregates, you would have to uh, make multiple uh, aggregate calls. Um, so we tested our implementations on a data set of 500,000 Quora questions. Uh, the first attempt uh, was uh, quite slow. It took a couple of minutes per query. Um, with the second approach that used array aggregation, that took about three seconds, which was fairly acceptable. And then uh, the last attempt with the custom aggregate function took, brought that down to one second, uh, which brings us much closer to the performance of specialized search engines like Elasticsearch. 
So uh, key takeaways. Um, you can implement a basic version of BM25 in Postgres with just SQL, although it's not super performant. Uh, you can implement an acceptable version of VM25 with just PLRS, which is a trusted programming language. And uh, you can also make this even faster with uh, privileged languages like uh, Rust to build uh, custom functions. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dee. Right. Oh, Mark, well, there's no point in me even sitting down, is there? Go. Hi, my name is Mark Wong. Uh, five seconds, get your camera ready. We're still working on updating the performance uh, farm. I got a couple of systems. Um, we can automatically test commits as they come in, upload patches, uh, customize test parameters, and generate charts like this when we get more tests in. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. That wasn't quite five seconds. I, I put it about 20. Okay, you use the left and right there. So next up, we've got Nita. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nita Goyal from Newt Global. And uh, first of all, I want to say that it's a pleasure to be here among all the amazing contributors and community who are making the Postgres every day better. Uh, I had an opportunity to talk about uh, present a lightning call in NYC. I got great feedback on how to make it fun, finish it in five minutes, so let's see. So why are we talking about Postgres and migration to Postgres? Open source databases have already exceeded commercial databases in market share by 50%, and there's a lot of interest to get to Postgres as well. The question is, how do I get to Postgres? So we start with this assessment. You know, we ask questions like, what's my schema? How many schema? What's the complexity? What are the dependencies? And then we get started with conversion. And once we start with conversion, then we are thinking, my god, I've got so many PL SQL code, complex features, constructs that Oracle supports, but we are still waiting on Postgres. And how do I do? And this is an example of one of the conversions. We are just for the execute immediate, there are more than 1,000 occurrences. And looking at every object and trying to find and remediate it is a Hercules task. But I get through it. And then easy part, I do the data migration, migrate, optimize, test, migrate, sync, and I'm ready for the next step. But wait, what about the applications? And there's a huge amount of embedded SQL sitting in the application. That too, they have static SQL, dynamic SQL, there are data types to be taken care of. And it's a huge task that most of the time is not looked at. And once I get through it, and actually hardly anybody gets through it if they don't have any automation, then I realize that still my test cases are failing because there are interfaces, there are upstream, downstream jobs, there are reports, and there's SQL everywhere. And really, the only way to deal with this is to automate, automate everything that's there. And there's a framework where we can do the automation at every stage at scale to make it easy to go through. But that's not the end of it. Even if we have the automation, it's not sufficient because we still need to have a plan, and then we get to the plan. Once we have the plan, we can get to the party and celebrate the life. So thank you, everyone. If there are any questions, get back to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Everybody seems to be well under five minutes at the moment. I'm never going to pronounce that correctly, am I? NS. Yeah, NS. NS. Yeah. Uh, left and right on there. Hi, everyone. I am NS, and I am a software engineer at UbiCloud. And we are building open source alternative to AWS. Today, I, I am going to talk about the, one of the most popular services that used by hundreds of people. And if you are using GitHub Actions, 
yeah, you can reduce your cost by 10x with a one-line change. Actually, it looks like too good to be true, but it's true. Uh, with a one-line change, you can reduce 10x. Actually, it's uh, very easy to migrate. After you change to your uh, deadline in your workflow files, the, your job's gonna start to run on the cloud runners instead of the default ones. And our runners are fully compatible with the GitHub Actions. So you continue to use the GitHub Actions as usual. You can check your logs, your jobs on the GitHub UI. And the R runners also has the default uh, pre-install software as the default runners, so you don't need to install anything extra. <coughs> Just change the line and it works. And it also is easy to roll back if you decide to roll back. I think there is no need, there is no reason to roll back. But if you decide to roll back, yeah, you can just revert to that line and you will use the default GitHub runners. And uh, as I said, the R runners just uh, cost 10x less than the default one at the same VCPU count. And also, in fact, if you check the numbers, the R60 uh, VCPU runners are more cost effective than the GitHub's two VCPU ones. And R runners are fully managed. You don't need to worry about any operational details. We just provision and deprovision virtual machine for each job. And the R runners runs even, even fast at this price point, so you don't need to sacrifice the performance. I benchmarked several open source repositories, and uh, uh, they, were, uh, they run on R runners faster. And while building the disk service, we keep the security and privacy in our mind. The, we just provision a clean and ephemeral virtual machine for each job. And the virtual machines are fully isolated using Linux KVM. We just follow the GitHub's security best practices. And we try to keep the, all the pre-installed software up to date. Yeah, it just takes five minutes to integrate today, but you will spend 10x less forever. So just give a try to our runners. We have a monthly three minutes, and it's easy and free. But if you send an email to us, we will give the 10,000 free minutes for the first 10 people. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Anis. Right, next up, Yelta. Here we go. Hi, I'm Elta. I work at MotherDuck, and I'm going to talk about Fiji DuckDB and why you'd want elephants with beaks and what's difficult about it. So, first of all, what is Fiji DuckDB? Well, it's DuckDB inside Postgres, and it's an extension. But, well, uh, we're at the Postgres conference, so not, no one knows DuckDB, maybe. So, what is this? Well, it's a lightweight, in process. SQL analytics engine. So it's basically like SQL Lite for analytics. That's kind of how you can look at it. So if you have Postgres here, <clears throat> in the left bottom, client server and transactional, fast and small queries, and DuckDB up in the right, in process and analytical. But because it's in process, we can actually put it inside Postgres and try to make Postgres cover the whole bottom to have a transactional and analytics database at once. So, what does that look like? Well, initially kind of like this <laughs> thing. Um, because that's, it's kind of hard to make this work. There's a lot of core differences between DuckDB and Postgres. Postgres in C, DuckDB is in C++. There's many differences between that. One very important one that's causing a lot of issues is having the error handling in Postgres and the exception handling in DuckDB work together because Postgres uses pgchai and pgcatch, which are Postgres custom things, and DuckDB uses exceptions, which you try and catch in C++, but they don't know about each other. So if you throw a C++ exception, then the, the, it will skip over all the pgtry and pgcatch things, and it will crash Postgres completely, and the other way around, it will not clean up any C++ memory if you jump over all its cleanup handling logic. And then there's the age-old age old thing about processes and threads. 
Postgres is a bit old, so it uses th processes for everything. DuckDB is not so old, so it uses threads. So we try to do a lot of work, and now we think it's ready to use, at least sort of to try it out. So we released v010 yesterday. Uh, <laughs> published the <laughs> And we published a blog post, I'll show the link later. So what can it do? It's, well, it can read and write parquet files and CSV files from blob storage, so from S3, from GCP, those kind of things. So you don't have to store everything in Postgres, but you can still query it and join it with your tables. And it can also use the DuckDB computation engine, execution engine, on data in Postgres tables. So if you have a query that's really slow in Postgres for some reason, you can try to run it in DuckDB and see if it's faster. And you can create actual columnar format tables, which DuckDB normally stores, if you, only if you use temp tables, because then we don't have to worry about wall and stuff like that. Or if you offload that, that analytics to MotherDuck, which is, well, well, I'm working for that, so then you can also run it there and don't have to worry about maybe analytics queries sort of taking up all the resources of your transactional workload. But, well, is it also fast? Uh, it depends. <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes, yes, yes, sometimes it's very fast. One extreme example is I set up a TCBDS benchmark with 10 gigabytes of data and no indexes. That's important because we don't, we don't use Postgres indexes yet. So if you run a Postgres query, first query in the TCBDS benchmark, if you run that on the data set, it's just, it takes forever. You wait 10 minutes and it, you give up. I think I let it run and it actually took like two hours to complete. It does something really weird. <laughs> but if you set this one setting, then suddenly it's done in 450 milliseconds. So, well, even if it doesn't work for all queries, if it works for like the five that don't work in Postgres, well, it's already, you don't have to turn it on for everything. You can use it for a few. Because it's the easiest query optimization ever, if it works. <laughs> So yeah, please try it, MIT licensed, repo is on GitHub, feedback is very welcome, and uh, yeah, blog post was published yesterday, so you can go add it to the, to the link in the QR code, that's the, like, the full link to the real blog. But it should be at the top still, I think. Maybe there's a new one, I don't know. All right, that's it. Well, that was the closest one to five minutes yet, with 12 seconds left to go, so nice timing. And I don't know if it's just me, but hadn't AI made our lightning talks a lot more interesting with the, uh, the generated images of elephants eating ducks, which is <laughs> quite disturbing, if I'm brutally honest. Hanu, uh, left and right. So I will complain a little, and then it's a call to action. But basically, Postgres, that's me, it's don't have time for that. So, so Postgres has uh, pseudotypes for any any array, any compatible array, but you actually, but you actually can't uh, use them yourself. So if you want to store anything, then then you can't, and uh, this can be sometimes a problem. And uh, you may want to store something that is not there, and and, and that is different in each uh, each of the. Uh, each of the rows. And it can come from a NoSQL database, uh, something like uh, Mongo Ferret, uh, some model output, some result of any analysis, or whatever else. We have uh, JSON and JSONB, and then we have also text, which kind of can store anything, but then it loses all the structure. And uh, especially uh, JSON is mostly used for these types of things, but it has a very limited set of uh, data types uh, and, and a simple thing like even a date or date time is more or less lost. There are some conventions, but there are no guarantees. And, uh, yep, and also, uh, especially for new types, it, it really is always a text if you try to store uh, something like uh, geographic types or, or embeddings or whatever new comes. So what we would need to do, we would need to make a version of JSON, JSONB that stores the type info together with the data. And, and it is 
at high level at least it's a very simple thing to describe at least, probably not the right, <coughs> but it should be something that keeps exactly what you saved and then you can get out the same, same thing always and if, if it's different then you get an error or you must handle the error. So uh, what we should do, we should uh, have common understanding and, and get together and write one that uh, is like JSON but that keeps types. This part seems more or less easy. The hard part is arguing how ordering will work because there are many places that uh, behave differently. Python can order any type of thing, but then it orders first by type and then by contents. I guess JavaScript probably does is something completely different, like uh, deciding on the fly if number one is text or string or something else. <laughs> and then there are a few others that also are is different. So at least uh, let's start uh, thinking about it, uh, talking about it, and, and uh, it would be really nice to have in next version, preferably, or it can be extension, of course, first, but it would be nice to have something that can keep the, all data you save. And yep, thanks. Thank you, Hannu. Raoul. I should give you the clicker because that way uh, it's the left and right ones there. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, today I wanted to show a nice little trick to migrate a database instance on a new server with near zero downtime using Replication Manager. So, my name is Raoul de Guftener. I'm working at the University of Louvain in Louvain and Oeuvre, uh, French speaking Belgium which is a rather large university for a small country. We are using Postgres since 9.3, that's 11 years ago. And uh, at the beginnings it was for small projects, but now we are using it for main application like or cloud or backups, uh, e-learning portal, uh, library management system, etc. And since a few years, uh, our main tool to manage the students' academic records from admission to diploma is written in-house in Python with Postgres. So obviously important stuff, these are to run 24-7. How do we do that? We have chosen to use small DB servers with internal storage. We have no multi-terabyte <coughs> databases, so we can do with these. Uh, with Debian, they are used in pairs in two data centers with streaming replication and HA proxy uh, doing the, the, the load balancing for high availability. And on top of that, we are using Replication Manager, RepMGR, what well, is Replication Manager? But it's a nice little tool developed by Second Quadrant and now EDB. I have no affiliation with EDB whatsoever. I'm just using their tools. Uh, what does Replication Manager do? Well, essentially, it does everything around the replication, like failover, switchover, promoting, registering, monitoring, uh, witness, uh, and so on. So let's say the situation is like this. We have two servers running a primary and a standby database. And for some reason, we need more room, we need more resources, uh, the hardware is too old. We have to move these databases on a pair of new servers. Uh, obviously, we have to set up the two new servers with Postgres Replication Manager, storage, connectivity, um, uh, authorization, and so on. But once it's done uh, with just one command line, Replication Manager Standby Clone, we can create a standby on these two new servers, blah, 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 Standby Clone is complete. Please do not forget to uh, uh, start up the new server and to register the new standby. So we do that on both servers and the situation is like this, with a primary running still on the old server and three replicas following this primary on three uh, other servers. Here's the magic. 
replication manager standby. Switch over, we can promote a new standby to primary. Replication manager takes care of everything. That's when the uh, downtime occurs because we have to ch shut down the primary, promote the standby, and uh, HA proxy has to catch up. But depending on your workload, it could be just a few seconds. Switchover was successful. And the situation is like this. We know the primary running on a new server and the three replicas following the new primary. If you're OK with that, you can unregister the, uh, the two old standby and decommission the old servers. And voila, with uh, a few common lines and just a few seconds of downtime, we have now a primary and a standby running on a new set of database servers. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was 33 seconds remaining. We're, um, I'm never going to hear the alarm on my phone, am I? Which is probably a good thing, because it will give me flashbacks to waking up this morning. All right, next we have our very own Chris. OK, so I'm going to talk about something slightly different. I'm going to talk about our conference website. And, you know, like a lot of design, it's a little bit love and hate relationship, right? So uh, if you hate it, then please feel free to tell me and blame me. If you like it, also feel free to tell me. Um, and a lot of people might not realize that there's an awful lot of work that goes into organizing this conference. And there's actually quite a lot of work that just goes into getting the website. And it's all our own home-built conference management system that people have written over the years. And just trying to restyle it has been a way bigger mountain than I expected compared to the molehill right that I thought it might be. And so why did I get into this? Well, I'm pretty stupid at times and very good at volunteering when I shouldn't. And I sort of kind of got involved in helping out organize PGD UK. And that went quite well last, this year and last year. And as part of this year, I asked my designer to help us redesign the website for PGD UK. You know, to have something a bit more kind of modern and sleek uh, and I kind of told him explicitly, right, remember this is all statically generated. Uh, I've got to build it. And I'm OK at CSS, but I'm not the best. Uh, so don't go a bit overboard. So he came up with this. Um, and then I kind of got dragged into helping out PJ Day Lowlands. <laughs> so we kind of use the same theme. And I've been trying to kind of make it more configurable and generic. And at the same time, PJ Day Conf EU was just starting, so I got dragged into Reskinning the PGD U, U, uh, PGConf EU site. And I think one of the things that I've been really trying to do is think about ULOT and not think about our conference management system. So one of the things I've been trying to do very much is express and explain things in kind of more normal language. So I've been trying to make stuff like really simple to get to the really important things. So I don't know, who put your hands up if you didn't realize the three things at the top of the page linked to the schedule? Excellent, it worked. And then things like you know having prominent call to actions placed frequently across the site that then also evolve with the conference lifecycle. And trying to make it easier to navigate those kind of important pages, I hope it was slightly easier to find your ticket this year. And then rather than just like listing out, dumping, this is the columns in the table for a bunch of stuff in the registration page, trying to explain stuff in language that's understandable to people and kind of present information more easily accessibly. Like, Trying to split up big blocks of text, make it easier for people who don't read very well, like myself, to scan stuff. And again, like at the end of the day, we forget. We're still marketing the conference, right? This is still a marketing website, fundamentally. Trying to have calls to actions in places to make it easier for people to, you know, let's just reinforce that, buy a ticket, please come. And then the schedule. That is not a simple beast to tame, especially for a, you know, four multi-tracks on three days. And there's definitely a lot of improvement that can happen here that I do kind of want to try and work on and improve. But I've been trying to get it so we have a nice visual hierarchy to make the most important things easily, you know, the first thing you spot. Trying to structure stuff that we can move it towards, they can act as kind of navigation aids and filtering aids and make it smarter. So, I mean, I've been pushing changes whilst I've been here to try and improve things. 
And there's still an awful lot to do. Uh, if you've poked around, maybe for a sponsor, you'll find that I did break a styling on quite a lot of HTML forms here and there. And that is something that I am working on trying to fix and improve. I would have got, liked to have got more of it done before now, but you know, things have happened and life happens. And then this is the bit I'm going to really regret. If any of you else runs a PG Day and you kind of want help using my theme or want help trying to restyle your site, um, drop me a line and then I'll worry about it later. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. And yeah, really big thanks for working on the, uh, the website for this event and the other ones you showed and the other six or seven that I'll show slides for later on that you can get working on as soon as you get home, okay? Right, next, Marat? Yeah. yeah, another one I got right. Hello everyone, my name is Marat and I work at Data Egrid. Today I wanna to talk how to make sure that our backups are reliable using Balji. Backup are very important, but they are only useful if we check their integrity. I start by highlighting uh, I start by highlighting the importance of uh, checksum validation. Uh, this is the only way to ensure that our data, data is not corrupted. It's also important to remember that uh, data checksum is disabled by defa default. It means that you must enable it every time when you create a new cluster. Interestingly enough, uh, there is a high chance that data checksum will be enabled by default in Postgres 18. Uh, I've seen a comment about this. But for those who hasn't enabled data checksum, there is a special tool, call it PG checksum. You can start use it since Postgres 12. It uh, let you enable uh, data checksum on your cluster and even verify your PG data catalog. But unfortunately, there is a major drawback. You can use this tool only when your cluster is offline. Fortune, fortunately, Valji provides some option that uh, avoid any downtime. Uh, the first option is verify. It allows us to verify checksum on each page during a backup process. Uh, there is some problem uh, with uh, checksum uh, with validation, but I'll cover it later. During uh, a backup process, Valji <coughs> provides all uh, logs in the CLI output, and it's crucial to analyze this output. You shouldn't, uh, uh, you, you shouldn't uh, overlook any warnings or error messages that you don't expect to see. On the slide, you can see uh, the backup was created successfully, uh, but uh, however, WALG warned us uh, about a potential uh, corruption in backups. Uh, and uh, it's a really dangerous situation and you should uh, uh, react uh, promptly to it. The next option is WALG verify. Uh, it's check, uh, it's check uh, our VAL archive. Uh, essentially, mm, with uh, this option, uh, sorry, pardon me. Okay, the second uh, option is VAL verify. It checks uh, integrity of uh, our VAL archive. Uh, and uh, on the slide, you can see that two files uh, have uh, missing clause status. Uh, they literally uh, don't exist in uh, VAL archive. And uh, it, it's, this is a potential dangerous situation because those gaps in uh, VAL chain uh, can prevent backup from being restoring using point-in-time recovery. Uh, 
And next slide. Uh, uh, recently, we found some bug uh, in Valgis uh, validation. Uh, it, skip, uh, it skips uh, checking some files that uh, have uh, non-standard file size. And on the slide, you can see an example. First, we uh, put uh, into, into, in the middle of the file uh, some extra bytes just to corrupt it, and then run uh, backup. The current version of Valg uh, create backups with no errors. But in reality, we, we know that uh, this backup contain uh, corruption data. But uh, the new uh, next release, next future re release, will handle this situation without any problem and warn the user, you can see on the slide. And final conclu conclusions must have. First, you must always enable checksum validation on your database cluster. Second, control your backup process and alert. It's also important to to implement that's, some... That's five minutes. Okay, so thank you very much. My microphone was turned off so nobody heard the alarm go. <laughs> thank you very much. Ads and floor. A double act. Yeah, because why do it alone when you have community, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right, so for anyone who was in uh, Clara's session this morning, they have already heard about our little community initiative and also she talked about how uh, wonderful it is to get recognized for the work that you do and also how wonderful it is to give recognition to other people, right? Um, so code contributions, of course, are uh, very uh, visible and recognized on the Postgres website, but as Christoph mentioned earlier, also continues other contributions will be listed on that website as well, which is wonderful. Uh, but generally, like all of the work that goes into non-core, non-code contributions, uh, they are largely invisible, like the Herculean effort of pulling on uh, this, this kind of conference and maybe smaller initiatives at the conference as well, like running a chess tournament or um, uh, convincing a local business owner to host uh, 49 nerds and one opera singer for a, a karaoke night uh, at their establishment. Uh, like all of the people that write training material for free or do podcasts that are freely available for everyone to uh, listen to and learn from, right? Uh, Enter, a new little website uh, that was inspired by a session that was on uh, PG Conf Dev in Van Vancouver earlier this year about how wonderful it would be if we could increase uh, community particip participation a little bit. Uh, we started this website to make sure that uh, we have a, a weekly list of all kinds of different contributions. Uh, again, blog post, uh, podcast, uh, uh, to recognize uh, event organizers for all of the work that they do uh, and, and list it here. So there's a small team that makes sure that this is updated uh, and we would love for you to contribute to this as well uh, because we mostly have contributors now or people that, that uh, maintain this list are all based in Europe. It would be excellent if we have some people uh, that can uh, find some more localized content as well to be featured on the website. Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, would love for to see all of your recognitions as well. I feel there's more. What's that? That's. We also have something for you, which is our event calendar. If you go to this website, you will find a link which you can add to your own calendar. And then every Postgres event we have, events, meetups, also call for papers, we have in this calendar, it will appear in your calendar. You can add a notification, you can make sure that you never miss a meetup, you can make sure that you never ever miss a call for papers, so there's no excuse anymore not to submit a talk. <laughs> this is made by also a small group of people, this is right now. If you have any event you want to have in this calendar, contact one of us or actually send an email to this address, it will also reach us. Okay. No, thank you very much, that's the floor. And with two minutes remaining, we're going to be finishing slightly early, I think. Right, where are we? I'm losing, losing all track of what I'm doing. Aaron? Left and right. 
more on the clicker. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Eren, and it's ex actually exciting to be here. So I will try to uh, be brief about my experiences on running Postgres on cloud. So from uh, my experiences from Cyrus Data on Cyrus Cloud and on Microsoft. So it's, it will be about provisioning backups, maintenance, and availability, and all that stuff. Um, so let's start. Um, so for, for me, the cloud is mainly about virtual resources. Um, you don't need to uh, act as they are very you know, uh, long living systems. You can just tear them up and create them up uh, over again. Um, so let's use it, right? Uh, so one of the key things is use images. You try, try to use images, create a VM, put your software, Postgres, extensions, all that stuff into it, test it. If that works, create an image of that and create, uh, use that. Don't try to modify your VM. like. Uh, act VMs as uh, immutable objects. Don't try to install a new package or upgrade all that stuff. Uh, if you want to change anything, create a new one with a newer version of your image and then just do a failover. Um, backups. Uh, we, when we talk about backups, it is usually base backups and the wall shipping. So for ba base backups, if your cloud provider has some uh, version of disk snapshots, they work great, super fast, super convenient. If not, we have the new uh, feature of uh, incremental backups. Just use it. And don't try to manage all that stuff yourself. We have good, great tools uh, like uh, for this. You just use WallG, essentially. Um, availability usually means you have a standby that is ready to take over, and maybe a control plane that you have written yourself, maybe. Uh, that has some uh, health check mechanism and uh, decides where, when to do a failover or not. Uh, one tip is use multiple sources. Like, like one thing could be just try to PSQL into the Postgres itself. That's great. But also maybe add another thing that is emitted from the VM itself or the Postgres itself, like a health check, some PG Chrome thing, or uh, in, in our case, just better, uh, see if uh, the replication is there or wall upload is uh, looking. Uh, it increases the uh, accuracy. And do things like practice this regularly, like uh, don't try, uh, don't wait until an actual failure happens because uh, I guarantee something will go wrong. And maintenance, like there are lots of aspects to the maintenance, but I will talk about the patching. So in a Linux machine, in a Linux box, you have lots of, lots of, lots of uh, software, Linux kernel itself, some packages you may or may not be aware of, and Postgres itself. Like there are tons of security patches going around, so you don't need to actually uh, follow all through them. Some important things you need to be uh, more timely, but usually just uh, update your VM image regularly, and then once in a while, probably maybe monthly, do a failover to you know practice it and refresh your ma machines. This is as I said, like what cloud is about, just replace all the time. Um, some bonus points, Pitter is a really great uh, feature, I love it. It is a time machine, and you don't know when you need it. You can easily forget a where clause when you do some stuff. Trust me, uh, how, don't, but don't ask me how do I know. Uh, it also works as a forking mechanism, like you can usually, it's a good idea to create a copy of it, uh, of your database while you are doing a fork, uh, a Peter, which is a fork, and it's a great way to test whether you upgrade an operating system version or uh, try a PG upgrade on a major version release of Postgres or one of your more complex extensions like Citus, Postgres, all that stuff. So it's good for testing. Um, and uh, thank you for listening to me. Uh, one thing is that if you uh, send, in, send us an email and you want to try Ubicola at Postgres, we have an offering, so commercials, uh, unfortunately, we will give you 35,000 minutes of credits. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Aaron. Claire, what number were you? 13. You're 13? I'm 13. And you remembered. Yeah, but where's the number? It's not on the screen. It's not on that, no. No, yeah, it was on the first one. These are like too tall for me. Okay. Okay. Oh, but how am I going to hold that and the clicker? Um, well, you press that, but okay, then you've still got the minute. two hands probably. Okay, wait, <laughs> I need help. I want to prove to my family that there's a lot of people in the room. So, hang on, I'll give you this. Yeah. You got that? Okay, I'm going to take a selfie. And let's see, will, will all of you be happy that I'm doing this, maybe? Thank you. Okay, cool, awesome. All right, did that count for time? Am I using my time? Yes, you are. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, as I know what this one's about, I can kind of pause it. I'm here to talk about my journey to Postgres and the PGCA Board of Directors. And this is a talk about PGCA, which is a Postgres-recognized nonprofit organization. 
And I've got a QR code on the screen, because if at any point in this talk, and I'll have more QR codes, you decide you want to support this nonprofit with a donation, that would be OK. I'm trying to make it easy for you. So if you're wondering what PGCA even is, um, I wondered that too once upon a time. There are four main Postgres nonprofit recognized organizations to know about. PGEU is the nonprofit that's behind this amazing event, right? Yes. And then there's PGUS, um, Salonic Events Canada takes care of events in Canada like pgconf.dev, and PGCA has a broader purview in terms of paying attention to uh, the trademark assets and the brand assets um, that are part of the Postgres project. And so that's our mission, is to shepherd and uh, protect those assets. And it matters because we need to ensure fair use of these Postgres trademark and brand assets, and that helps keep Postgres free and open source. And if you haven't noticed, there's a QR code in the upper right-hand corner, <laughs> just making sure you know that you can make a donation at any time. So, but I said this talk would be about my journey to this board and my journey to Postgres. So does anybody recognize what city this is? Taipei, Taipei Taiwan, exactly. And I was born there. And, but that was not where my Postgres journey began because it was not predetermined from birth that I would be here today and that I would work on Postgres. Um, so you might think, oh, the journey started in college. And I did study computer science and mathematics, but I didn't even take a database class. I skipped that one. So that's not where my journey began. It probably began in 2017 when I joined Citus Data, uh, which was a small Postgres startup focused on scaling out. Or maybe it started in 2018 in Lisbon, which is actually where I met many of the people in this room. Um, and I gave my first public Postgres talk. Um, fast forward a few years, Microsoft buys Citus Data. Fast forward a few years, I go sailing in Greece in the summer. This was taken a month ago, and that was our boat in the front of the picture. Um, it's 2024. I'm working with the PGCA board to secure a trademark license for this podcast that I host every month that was formerly called Path to CitusCon, and we really wanted Postgres in the name because it's a podcast about Postgres and Postgres people. And uh, I'm also getting ready for PG Day Chicago, wonderful one-day event organized by Hedy Dombrowskaya, and I'm going to be a speaker there, so I was pretty excited, and I get this email from Jonathan Katz asking if I have time to meet with him in Chicago. And I thought, oh no, what did I do wrong? Like, did I screw up? Did I make a mistake? Am I going to get my trademark license? Uh-oh, what's going on? But in fact, we got together for a drink um, in a lobby of a hotel prior to the speaker dinner, and he wanted to meet to explore the possibility of me joining the board of directors. So that's my journey onto the board. And I just want to make sure that all of you know about PGCA, because I've become convinced, as I did research deciding whether to join, that protecting uh, even an open source project's trademark license is a really important part of keeping that open source project healthy. And so we pay attention to trademarks across the European Union, as well as Canada and the United States, manage the domain name postgresql.org, and we provide these no-cost trademark licenses to organizations who want to use Postgres brand assets um, in ways that are outside of fair use. Um, so you need to know two things. First, there is a Postgres trademark policy. You can find it online. Go check it out. And there's a QR code on the screen because we are fundraising. Um, if your company you think might be interested in making a donation, come reach me or any of the other board members and let us know too because we accept individual and corporate sponsorships. And I just want you all to enjoy the last few minutes and I uh, hope you had a wonderful time. Enjoy your Postgres journey. Thank you. Yeah, 17 seconds left. Thank you, Claire. And if you didn't notice, there is a QR code on the screen there. Pick up your phone and donate, please, because we do need funding to uh, help protect the project. Right, I think I'm probably safe in saying, aside from the, the little title slides that Karen put in, which obviously our speakers all filled out and put into the box, you couldn't tell which ones were the yellows, the beginners, and which ones were the blues, right? Because all of those speakers were awesome. And I, yeah, let's give them all another round of applause.
So thank you very much to them. Thank you very much to Karen for organising our new system for this year. And I'm going to take 30 seconds to switch over to a completely different slide deck. Wait for my glamorous assistant over there to make his way up to the front. And we'll get on with the closing session. Huh, that was easy. Have you got a microphone, Magnus? No. Oh. <laughs>